Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about photosynthesis. In this particular video, we're going to look at photosynthesis in general. Get a big idea of it, uh, come to some conclusions perhaps, but we're not going to look at the detail of it. I hope to create a couple more videos where we look in depth at the light and dark reactions and the biochemical reactions that make up photosynthesis, which are totally interesting. But this introductory video is also relevant because it's general and it provides kind of an overview of the process. And what I mean by that, right out of the gate, is that most life on the Earth is solar powered. So you could appreciate that perhaps when you look at this tree and you're like, well, it's obviously it's powered by the sun, but I am not powered by the sun. But you are because indirectly you're eating organisms for plants or other animals uh, that give you energy that came from photosynthesis. And so most of life on the earth is solar powered ultimately, directly or indirectly. There's a couple of exceptions uh, and I'm going to talk about those in the video. So a little cliffhanger right there. So not all organisms rely on the sun. So plants, uh, which are our land autotrophs, uh, use photosynthesis to capture the sun and they produce uh, organic molecules. And so organic molecules uh, are those that contain carbon. And so what they directly do is they, they, uh, they use the energy of the sun to produce sugars, and then those are then broken up into whatever organic molecules plants need otherwise. And so they convert the energy of the sun to the chemical energy that's stored in the bonds of sugars and other organic molecules. So pretty cool. I'm not going to get into that biochemistry in this video, but that is very interesting. And so plants and other autotrophs are the producers of the biosphere. So everywhere there's life. So I, I just want to use this ocean example here because photosynthesis nourishes almost all the living world directly. Either or, like animals are eating these plants or eating other animals that have been eating the plants. And so this is where we're getting our energy from, from eating plants. And so we all organisms require those organic compounds uh, for energy, but also just the carbon skeletons in order to produce amino acids and fatty acids, that's those sorts of things, and nucleic acids. And so how does carbon get in to the ecosystem? Well, it comes in in the form of carbon dioxide. And so it's such a, such a um, I don't know uh, what to say, such a small uh, invisible gas is so, so important because plants can take in carbon dioxide in their leaves principally they can also take it in in other locations in the stem, but principally in the leaves. And so this is the source of carbon into the, uh, into the whole ecosystem. In other words, this is a, a little bit of a discussion of the carbon cycle. So carbon comes in and ultimately photosynthesis is going to uh, fix that carbon uh, to a wa water to produce carbohydrates. It's not as simple as that, but ultimately that's what's going on. And so plants can use this to produce all their organic uh, molecules. And you're like, well, what about nitrogen? What about phosphorus? What about magnesium? Sure, those things are taken up in the roots and then also transported throughout, but basically all of your carbon skeletons. And so the uh, organic molecules that have carbon in them like this, ultimately, and I'll draw in some hydrogens, ultimately these carbons came from the input uh, of carbon dioxide. And so autotrophs are the producers. And so they're able to take uh, carbon dioxide right out of the, the thin air, if you will. And then, you know, here you are down here, <laughs> some cows looking at us. And so um, ultimately, it's the, it, it's the source of organic compounds for all non-autotrophic organisms as well. And so this is how we're getting, you know, again, as a primary consumer, this is how we're getting our carbon skeletons to create all of our organic molecules by eating. So it's a part of the food chain. So photosynthesis is the base of our source of energy and it is the base of our source of carbon so that we can create all organic molecules. Very, very important. So autotrophs uh, can be separated as it turns out. And so um, what I talked to you a little bit about uh, at the beginning of the video about not all organisms being photosynthetic. These are photosynthetic autotrophs. And so it's not just plants. I know we humans live on the land. We dwell on the land where 
um, or the terra, we kind of relate to autotrophs that are land, which are plants that have defined leaves and roots and what have you. But there are many uh, autotrophic organisms, photoautotrophs, such as algae that live in the ocean or lakes that are photosynthetic. And so we don't want to discount them. And then there's also protists, these microscopic organisms that are so profoundly numerous. Um, here you, you can see this euclina right here that's photosynthetic. And then, of course, there's a lot of prokaryotes, you know, uh, small microscopic organisms, like, for example, uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green bacteria, uh, are capable of photosynthesis. And so all of these organisms contribute to sugar production and are part of the food chain. And they also, by the way, produce oxygen, which is also a byproduct of photosynthesis. But what about the ones that don't use the sun? Well, these are called chemoautotrophs. They're still autotrophic because they can make their own energy. And what they do is they oxidize that energy uh, from inorganic substances. And, and again, um, like such as sulfur and ammonia that, that are spewing from the earth in these deep uh, thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. So these are chemo. They don't use the energy of the sun. They use chemical energy and also the heat uh, as a catalyst from these thermal vents. And so these are exclusively bacteria that are chemoautotrophs. Pretty interesting. And so heterotrophs, like us, hetero means other, so eating something else. So we live on the organic compounds that are produced by the autotrophs. We're consumers. So we go along and we either eat autotrophs directly or we eat others. If we're primary consumers, then we're eating the autotrophs directly. If we're secondary, then we're eating the primary consumers. And so uh, it might be obvious, but uh, we're dependent <laughs> upon the autotrophs. That's why it's so critical. And here's something that's also extremely important is there's another class of heterotrophs that are decomposers. And so these are organisms that eat on dead organisms or these organic litter like fallen leaves, for example, fungi and bacteria are decomposers. And so they're heterotrophs. They don't make their own food. And so they come along and they eat for energy. So the fungus is breaking down uh, leaves, for example, or, or wood, and it's using the sugar in the wood for a source of energy. But in so doing, it's taking these molecules and breaking them down very simply so that they're made available and recycled to the next generation of autotrophs. And so that's pretty cool. So we're reliant on photosynthetic organisms for not only organic compounds for energy and for uh, carbon molecules, but also, also oxygen, which is very important. And so where's all this happening inside photosynthetic organisms? Well, inside of a plant cell, this, these little boxes right here are plant cells, this prominent organelle, these little structures, I shouldn't say little, they're rather large and easily viewable with the light microscope are called chloroplasts. You've probably heard of them. That's where photosynthesis takes place, and it most often occurs in the leaf. The leaf is the primary photosynthetic structure of a, of a plant, but really any green part, like for example a cactus, its leaves are not photosynthesizing, photo, photosynthesizing but they're needle-like uh, as a source of defense and also reducing transpirational loss. So the leaves are the primary source, though, and so each of this, uh, the tissue of a plant, is composed of many cells, and inside the cell are many chloroplasts. And so uh, the chloroplasts are green because they contain a pigment. And a pigment, again, you, we've all heard that word, but what is it? What is a pigment? Pigment's a chemical. And so uh, chlorophyll is a really cool uh, pigment. There's many kinds. In a separate video, I'll get into more detail on this. There's a couple of different types of chlorophyll. But basically, it's a hydrocarbon right here, sort of like a lollipop. It has a stick in this big circular ringed area with a magnesium in the center. And so what it does is it's capable of uh, picking up wavelengths of light. And so that's what a pigment is. It's capable of absorbing light. And so that's going to have to be a, uh, another conversation at a different time. But that's kind of interesting. And so the color of uh, leaves come from the fact that there's more than one kind of pigment that are found in leaves, but chlorophyll happens to be green, and it's the, it's the uh, dominant, it's the primary pigment in, 
in leaves. And so that's, that's why leaves are green, because they have a lot of chlorophyll. And so that absorbs light during photosynthesis, just, just saying. And so here's a leaf. And so you can take a leaf and you could uh, lift it up and you can look very closely at it. And this may become, <laughs> this is kind of surprising to you perhaps, but a leaf is kind of complicated inside, you know, even though it's thin. It has several tissue layers. And so a tissue is a group of cells that sort of work similar and, and they have a similar uh, physiology, a similar function. And so this sort of clear sandwich area is the epidermis of the leaf. Notice there's no chloroplast, so it's clear. This little thin layer right there is a waxy cuticle, which reduces water loss. And so all the cells in the middle are just generically called mesophyll for middle part. And so this is where photosynthesis is taking place. And of course, a vein is where uh, water is arriving at the leaf. And this is also where sugar which is produced during photosynthesis is taken away. So it's a, it's, it's a little transportation tissue. And so uh, again, the detail of that I'm not gonna get into, but there's specialized vascular tissue. But this is mesophyll in the middle. And then you might notice on the bottom here, there are specialized cells in the lower epidermis that are green, green because they have chloroplasts in them. And those openings are called stomata. And it is through those pores those little mouths, if you will, is how CO2 actually enters into a leaf. And so the CO2, if I were to, to illustrate it, the CO2 is entering in mainly in the underside of the leaf. And oxygen that's produced during photosynthesis is also exiting on the lower side of the leaf. And so that's kind of interesting, I find. And so chloroplasts are mainly found in the mesophyll cells in the middle of the leaf. And as I mentioned, Gases exchange CO2 in, oxygen out, through these little microscopic pores called stomata, an important term uh, that will come up in future videos, I assure you. And so the veins, again, as I mentioned before, deliver uh, things that are needed by all cells in the plant. You can see the veins right here. They take away sugar. They also provide uh, nutrients, like things that the plant took in from the, you know, if I were to draw the whole plant like this, it's like when you take in nutrients from the soil, it, that, that's got to travel up like magnesium or nitrogen, any of these compounds, potassium, all these things come up in, into vascular tissue and then come down the branch into these leaf branches called petioles, and then ultimately through the venation of the leaf, and then they arrive at the cells. So it's kind of like a little vascular system there. And so each individual cell, as I was mentioning, is, uh, contains a lot of these chloroplasts. They're really large. And they're, I would almost go as far as to say they're kind of gigantic. Although, again, microscopic. And so it's relatively speaking gigantic. So a typical mesophyll cell has about 35 uh, chloroplasts in them. And they can kind of move around, um, which is called cytoplasmic streaming. They can move around in the, in the cytosol. And so these, these are about uh, five to six microns in, 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 uh, in size, and so they're pretty huge. And so when you look at the whole leaf, okay, so this is what we've been talking about. This, th this upper layer, kind of waxy part, is, is a lipid, which reduces water loss, and it also prevents uh, infection from, uh, from bugs that are trying to get the leaf. It's this single layer. This simple layer, which is what we call a single layer, a simple layer of cells called the upper epidermis. And then down below, a single layer called the lower epidermis. And again, down here in the lower one is where you have a lot of stomata. Uh, stoma meaning plural, but stomata are these uh, pores that are, that are uh, flanked by these two cells called guard cells that, are, that can photosynthesize. They open and close, and they allow for gas exchange. So oxygen out, CO2 in. They can also allow water to evaporate out as well, called transpiration. And that's not insignificant. The fact that water evaporates from the leaf or transpires from the leaf ultimately drives capillary action, which pulls the water up the plant in the first place against gravity. So that's rather huge. And so check this out. The mesophyll cells are the main site 
of photosynthesis. So all this middle area, these are the cells that are photosynthesizing. So what's fascinating is you can notice this sort of upper mesophyll is called palisade. I believe this is an incorrect uh, terminology here. This should say pal palisade mesophyll, and this is spongy mesophyll. As it turns out, the word palisade means sort of like columns, like a fence. And that's curious because when light comes down from above, obviously, to a leaf, it's sort of like water raining down. And if the cells are flanked really close together, like they are here in the upper palisade mesophyll, not a lot of light's going to be able to get past that. And so like a fence, it captures or prevents any light from getting past. Pretty cool. But then, check this out, in the spongy mesophyll down below, notice the spacing between the cells. It's rather porous like a sponge, which allows for gas exchange. Ooh, gases can circulate. So that's a really cool example of structure related to function. And then, of course, the vein over here is made up of specialized vascular tissue, which conducts water um, and uh, sugar water and also some minerals. And the, the cells that circular that are around the vein are called bundle sheath cells. So a lot of terms. So let's focus finally in on the chloroplast itself, that really large structure in. So what's interesting is you can go, if I go back here, you can see these little tiny green dots are the chloroplasts. Now we're really going to get it in close up look at them. In particular, we need to do that because if we're going to get into the biochemistry of photosynthesis, we need to, of course, understand the structure of a chloroplast. So again, this is rather significant. So the chloroplast, um, just to start off, has two outer membranes. Okay, So these are outer membranes. And when I say a membrane, I mean a phospholipid bilayer. So there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane, and they're flanked right next to each other. And so inside the fluid of the chloroplast, it's almost like a cell itself. And again, uh, we believe that it really was once a free living cell in a sense that it does have DNA in this fluid uh, called the stroma. So this sort of aqueous area inside here is called the stroma, as opposed to stomata, which I was referring to a moment ago as the pores, but the stroma is the fluid of the chloroplast. There's some DNA in there, and there are some ribosomes in there too, so it's pretty interesting. And so the stroma contains these membranous sacs. In other words, these circular stacks, which are sort of like, in an analogy, like a stack of pita bread, like meaning that they're sort of hollow inside. Each one is called a thylakoid. Okay? And if you have a stack of them, it refers to as a granum. How's that for a term? Granum. And then many are grana. <laughs> so there's a lot of grana, which are it, or stacks of thylakoids inside the stroma. And notice how they're green. And so that's significant. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to draw that. And so uh, the thylakoid itself looks like this. Okay, and so it's made up of a membrane. And if I put another one there, and another one there, and another one there, I, I'm, I'm making a, a granum. Okay, so, but each one is a thylakoid. And so what's interesting, perhaps, is the fact that uh, there's this internal aqueous space. And so um, inside here is referred to as the thylakoid lumen. And that's going to be important because when we talk about the, the biochemistry, this is uh, what we're going to be talking about is inside here. Or sometimes it's just simply the thylakoid space or thylakoid matrix or the thylakoid lumen. And it's significant by the fact that these thylakoids are green because they're green because they contain the pigment chlorophyll. This is where chlorophyll is. And so if I were to draw the whole chloroplast, let me try to do that. I'll draw the whole chloroplast. It has an outer membrane and then it has this inner membrane like this and then this area is the stroma right there the stroma uh, and then these are the thylakoids right here which are green inside and so um, again 
another picture of the uh, <laughs> showing the green nature of the chloroplast because that's where the chlorophyll is located. And so there are these stacks called uh, grana right in there. And so this is obviously a cartoon drawing, but if you were to look at under the transmission electron microscope, pretty cool. This is a chloroplast, but it's not it's not in uh, color, obviously, but if you were to make it color, like each one of these are the thylakoids. And um, there's many more than I can, I can't draw at that then, but these are the stacks. So there's a, a granum. So together there's lots of grana. So these are the th stacks. So there's a lot of membrane. And so you might be wondering, what's the story with all this membrane inside of a chloroplast? Well, spoiler alert, this is how plants are going to use the electron transport system to generate a lot of ATP and reduced coenzymes in order to produce sugar in the stroma. And so that's why the more membrane you have, the better you're able to photosynthesize. And so we'll obviously want to talk about that in detail later. So I hope you enjoy this video on the introduction to photosynthesis. Thanks for watching.